Okay, so in the last lecture we talked about psychological egoism, right? And so psychological egoism, this idea that human nature is such that we're selfish, self-interested, you know, it seems to pose a challenge to ethics because this idea, well, if you can only act in self-interested ways, then if there is a moral theory, it's going to have to, you know, deal with that. It's going to have to only appeal to our self-interest, right? And I said, well, you know, that's really only true of the strong form of psychological egoism, and strong psychological egoism just doesn't seem true. People, there's all kinds of evidence, people do act for reasons that aren't self-interested. Well, look, if ethical egoism isn't true, or sorry, if psychological egoism isn't true, then why even talk about ethical egoism? You know, seems like maybe the only reason we're talking about ethical egoism would be, well, we think psychological egoism is true in the strong form, strong psychological egoism, so our moral theory is going to have to be a form of ethical egoism. But if that is not true, as we saw that it isn't, then why even take ethical egoism seriously? It looks like a non-starter. Remember our sort of three steps in thinking about a moral theory, you know, whether something is a good moral theory or not. We try to come up with a theory that explains moral judgments we're sure about or agree on. We test the theory against other moral claims and judgments we're sure about, and then we apply the theory to less certain cases. Well, look, ethical egoism seems to fail too miserably. I mean, look, imagine that you are, you know, or imagine that this guy is babysitting his little cousin, and, well, you know, the guy, we'll call him Smith, is next in line for this inheritance, but the cousin is first in line for it. If the cousin were to die, he inherits the family fortune. Well, so Smith thinks to himself, well, what if the kid had an accident in the bath? He drowns. You know, should you drown your five-year-old cousin for money, right? Obviously not, right? That's a moral judgment we agree on, right? Well, ethical egoism seems like it would say, well, you know, can you get away with it? Are you, are you going to get caught? You know, ethical egoism would either say, yeah, go ahead and do it, it seems, or it would say, well, you know, don't do it because there's a good chance you'll get caught. Well, look, moral theory should give us the right answers for claims we're sure about, and it should give us the right answer for good reasons. You know, kill a five-year-old for money, and yeah, don't do that, but only because you might go to jail. They both seem to fail too miserably, right? And it's hard to even find, you know, it's hard to even see how it passes one, right? Most of us don't think that morality flows out of self-interest is based on self-interest. In fact, most of us think that morality limits our self-interest, right? So ethical egoism just seems <laughs> a complete non-starter of a theory. But why does it get so much attention? You know, there people will try to develop forms of ethical egoism. You'll see this. Ayn Rand does this. Most philosophers don't think too much of Ayn Rand, you know. You, you ask a philosopher, they think of Ayn Rand. Yeah, you're, you're not going to get a high opinion usually. Um, but there are other people who do it too, right? You know, Thomas Hobbes, philosophers actually do respect, tries to develop a form of ethical egoism. Um, arguably, this other philosopher, Nietzsche, does too, right? And a lot of people take it seriously. Well, why do people devote so much attention to ethical egoism and psychological egoism if ethical egoism doesn't seem like a plausible theory and psychological egoism has all this evidence against us, at least strong psychological egoism does? 
Well, I think part of it is that it's shocking. And people are interested by shocking or surprising things. But interesting, shocking or surprising things are interesting. Interesting doesn't mean true, right? Well, but let's think, is there anything attractive, any reason for being attracted to ethical egoism? Well, I think there's two reasons. One, you know, some people are attracted to ethical egoism because they're psychological egoists. That seems to be Hobbes's reason. But we've already seen, well, you know, psychological egoism is probably not true. But even if you're not a psychological egoist, there seems to be some reasons to at least be intrigued by ethical egoism. One of them is, well, all other things being equal, it is rational to act in your self-interest. What, what do I mean by this, rational? Well, look, if I ask you why you did something and you cite some way that it was good for you, right? That's a way of making sense of your action to show that, well, it makes sense. Rational is just a fancy way of saying it makes sense. It's reasonable. If I ask you why you're taking this class and you reel off some self-interested reasons, you know, going to help me get my degree sooner. I have to do it for my degree. You know, it looks good on a transcript. You know, if you do that, it makes sense of why you're taking this class. So given that it's rational to act from self-interest, you know, all other things being equal, there seems to be also, you know, you might wonder, it's like, well, moral theories come in and say, well, it's rational to, you know, act contrary to self-interest. When morality tells you to do it, doesn't that create kind of a tension in our thought, right? There's a theoretical issue there. But there's also this practical problem. You know, there's this why be moral question. If you have to do something that involves a lot of sacrifice that really hurts you, why do it, right? Why be moral? If we can show that there's really no conflict between self-interest and what morality asks for us, it seems to give us a very good answer to this practical why be moral question. All right. So there is some reason to take this theory seriously. And many ethical egoists, you might call them refined ethical egoists, will say that the problem is, the reason ethical egoism looks silly is that we don't properly understand self-interest. If we really understand what self-interest is, we'll get a more refined form of ethical egoism that doesn't run into the problems that other forms of ethical egoism do. All right, so what is self-interest? You might say, well, it's doing what you think is good for yourself, acting in pursuit of your own welfare, well-being. Well, that doesn't really clear up much, right? That just kind of pushes the problem back a step. Because then you want to ask, well, well what is good for you, right? What is good for us? What What is, you know, what makes our lives go well? Well, the Epicurean, you know, Epicurus wrote the letter, why did you guys read? He was the founder of the school of philosophy. Epicurus gives us a form of ethical egoism. And, Eth and Epicurus' first step is to answer this question. And he says, well, what is it that's good for you and makes your life go well? happiness. Then you might say, well, okay, but it doesn't clear up a whole lot because we still need to know what happiness is. And Epicurus is pretty helpful there too, right? He says, well, happiness and happiness equals, it is the, you know, what happiness is, is pleasure and the absence of pain in the long term. And now Epicureanism 
subscribes to a view that philosophers call hedonism. Utilitarianism, the next moral theory we'll look at, actually does too, but it makes a few steps that make it really different from Epicureanism. But they both agree on this hedonism, right? And what hedonism says is all that matters is happiness, and happiness is nothing more than pleasure and the absence of pain. If you're a hedonist, you know, over the course of your whole life, you can think of pain as a red number or a minus number, pleasure as a black number or your number with a plus in front of it. You want the plus number to come out as high as possible. Well, look, you hear this term hedonism and you probably think of some rock star, you know, Keith Richards or somebody like that, right? Well, is that really what hedonism means? Is that what the Epicurean is going to say we should do? The Epicurean will actually say not. The Epicurean will say, should we pursue hard to find luxuries and experiences? And the Epicurean will say no. The very fact that they're hard to find means it's a lot of trouble to get a hold of them, right? You might get some pleasure from them, you're going to get a whole lot of pain either from them or, you know, just in the things you have to do to get them, right? You know, lobster, yes, lobster is delicious, right? But it costs a lot of money, you got to earn money somewhere, you know. When you think about the pain, the bother of going after these things, it's just not worth it. The Epicurean will say, simple, easily obtained pleasures are the best. And not just that. The Epicurean will say, other pleasures, things that are hard to get a hold of, are actually dangerous. They wouldn't quite use this language of addiction, but you know, if you decide that you want champagne and lobster or fancy coffee or you need a really large house, it's not just that those things are hard to get, that they take a lot of work. They involve a lot of unhappiness going after them. The Epicurean will say you become dependent on them. You get frustrated when they're not there. You start to need them. So, the simple, easily obtained pleasures are the best. You should train yourself to pursue the simple pleasures, the easily obtained ones, and you should be happy with them. And I think you can think of Epicureanism as sort of an answer to two questions. You know, what is good for each of us? Happiness, and we'd say happiness is nothing but pleasure in the absence of pain as much pleasure as possible with as little pain as possible. All right. Well then, whose good should we care about, right? And the Epicurean, this is what makes them an egoist, will say, ultimately our own and only our own. Our goal in what we do should be to maximize our own pleasure, minimize our own pain. What does this look like? Should we pursue wealth? No, or at least certainly not to excess, right? The Epicurean will say it's not bad to have enough money that you're secure. But, you know, lives devoted to pursuing money are very stressful. They involve a lot of work. And even, and even having too much money is dangerous, right? You know, again, you become dependent on it, you run this risk of coming to value money for its own sake, which is stupid and horrible, the Epicure will say. The only thing that really matters is pleasure, right? And the absence of pain. Should we pursue power over others? And again, the Epicurean will say no. It takes a lot of work and it's stressful, and in many situations, it's even dangerous.
and again, you become dependent on you know, having power, you become used to it, and unhappy if you can't get it. Too much stress, too much hassle, right? Live a simple life where you don't try to dominate others. That, for the Epicurean, is the happy one. What about friends? If you were a good Epicurean, should you try to have friends? And the Epicurean will say, yes, yes, absolutely. That's one of the most important things is to develop friends to have friends. Well, you might say the Epicurean, okay, okay, but you don't really mean friends as in people you care about, now no, no, do you, Epicurean? You mean people who might be useful to you whom you care about for ways that they might be useful, right? And the Epicurean will say, no, no, I mean, you should develop relationships with people that you care about for their own sake. And, and you might say, whoa, 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 listen, Mr. Epicurean. How in the world does that fit with your egoism? I should only care about my own good. And the Epicurean say, well, making friends is in your self-interest. Having true friends is justified for self-interested reasons. Why is that? True friendship brings great pleasures, right? It's fun to be around your friends. You enjoy their company. And it also protects us from a lot of unhappiness. When bad things happen to you, your friends can help out. They can also be a form of solace just talking to them, you know, they take the edge off the bad times. And the Epicurean will say, look, this isn't as weird as you're trying to make it out to be, right? Look, you make friends, you originally want to make friends for the purpose of happiness, for pleasure, but making friends to get more pleasure is hardly inconsistent with caring about your friends for their own sake. Think about this, right? The only reason that people play a game like golf or basketball or chess or whatever is because the game is fun. It brings them pleasure. But you can care about the game for its own sake, you know, right? You can be really into wanting to win your game and being mad if you lose. In fact, the game being fun requires that you really do care about the game for its own sake. If you don't care about winning or losing, if you don't care about, you know, uh, what is it, golf, I guess it's strokes or whatever, if you don't care about how many strokes, you can tell I don't really care about golf, but if you don't care about how many strokes you take to get through the course, completely apathetic about the game, it's just not going to be fun. For a game to be fun requires that you care about it for its own sake. The Epicurean will say the same is true of friends. Friends only bring you happiness or the most happiness if you care about them for their own sake. Well, this gives us a form of egoism that's really a lot different than we might have thought, right? You know, you know, think about my case of the guy who's going to drown his little cousin for money. The Epicurean would say, no, 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 look, this, this guy is completely misguided. Obviously, you shouldn't care about money that much, right? That's just a bad character. Caring about money that much in and of itself is going to make you unhappy. You know, caring about, and if you're that kind of person who would murder a family member, you probably have a bad character. You're not going to be able to make friends. Friends are a huge source of happiness. You know. And the Epicurean would say, you know, they're an egoist. They would say, yeah, and if, and if you kill the kids, you're going to spend your whole life looking over your shoulder. You know. Wouldn't Epicurean say, help your friends out? Yes, you should help your friends out because you want to maintain good relationships because that will bring you the most pleasure in the end. So I think at the Epicurean, by asking what self-interest really is and thinking about it a bit, can give us a form of ethical egoism that looks different than we might have thought that's not as crude and gross as we might have thought. Now, is this form of ethical egoism ultimately a plausible, ultimately a good moral theory? Well, we'll see if it is when we go through the case studies. 
I think we're going to see that, that you know Epicureanism solves some problems with egoism, but maybe some remain.